Hey, it's Larry. Uh, thanks for listening. Happy New Year. Real quick, before we get into this episode, I had such an amazing, eye-opening, life-changing experience at the World Parkinson Congress in Kyoto that I want others to have that opportunity, too. So Becca Miller and I and 24 of our PD community friends have launched a year-long WPC Travel Grant Fundraiser. We're each doing a two-week Facebook fundraiser. Mine's underway right now because my birthday's January 9th. All the money raised will be used to help offset travel costs so more people with young-onset Parkinson's can attend the next WPC in Barcelona in 2022. You can search out details on the When Life Gives You Parkinson's Facebook page or donate directly to the WPC website. Go to wpc2022.org slash yopdfund. If you or your business would like to supply matching funds... Hey, good on you. Email me at parkinsonspod at curiouscast.ca. And now, on with the show. Hi, I'm Larry Gifford. I have Parkinson's disease, and I'm going to the World Parkinson's Congress. This is WPC 2019, the official podcast for the 5th World Parkinson Congress. The event's being held June 4th through 7th, 2019 in Kyoto, Japan. This podcast created in collaboration with the World Parkinson Coalition and my other podcast, When Life Gives You Parkinson's. Each episode, we preview guests and topics that are going to be featured at the WPC. Today, we focus on YOPD, Young Onset Parkinson's Disease. We'll discuss how to live well with Parkinson's, maintaining balance in work and life as someone with a career, as someone with a child, and as someone who is sick and tired of staying inside, hiding from the diagnosis, and letting it win. When I called up Emma Lawton on Skype, I was greeted with a big smile, mostly hidden by fire-red hair. She lives in the UK and was diagnosed with Parkinson's in April 2013 at the age of 29. She's a WPC 2019 ambassador, and when you meet her today, her neck is coiled over and her head is facing down due to a prolapsed disc in her neck. That doesn't kink her spirit or her ability to lift others. Emma, welcome to the pod. Hi, thank you. Nice to be here. Uh, well, it's great to have you. Uh, you have so many uh, great tips and secrets. I, I follow you online, and you're doing such amazing things. But let's start at the beginning. Uh, before Parkinson's, what was life like for you? Um, pretty average, I would say. I think I was kind of a regular 28, 29-year-old, just sort of fairly happy with my lot you know just sort of doing what most people of that age do not really very driven um I think I needed a bit of a kick up the backside to be honest and I think actually Parkinson's gave me that I wasn't really wanting it but it's uh it's definitely changed my life in a way that's had a lot of positives that I never would have expected really how did PD enter your life um, I basically had a kind of a strange feeling in my right arm um I didn't have a tremor or anything it was kind of weakness at this point and uh my dad used to kind of say to me that I kind of walked a bit funny sometimes and I'd want to he'd like try and shake my hand and kind of test the strength of it to see whether I was getting weaker. And my family, I think, were quite concerned about it. But I was quite, you know, 29 year old, quite nonchalant about it, you know, <laughs> didn't want to go to the doctors, didn't want to get it checked out, didn't think it was anything important. And uh, it was only when I sort of eventually said to my dad that I'd go to the doctors and get it checked out that they said they thought it might be neurological. And I didn't really know what neurological was. It kind of sounded like a, you know, scary word, but I hadn't really had that much to do with neurology up until that point. So uh, that's kind of, that was my kind of first foray into the world of the brain. And I think I then went to get my brain scanned and um they said they thought it was a couple of potential different things, and actually Parkinson's was the one that sounded the least like I was going to die from it. So I was actually sort of rooting for Parkinson's in a strange way. Um, I was actually designing the Parkinson's UK website with work at that point in time at the design agency I was working at. We were working on that, so I knew a lot about Parkinson's, and actually I kind of thought, well, this sounds like the lesser of a few different evils. And I'm not sure I thoroughly still think that way now, but it was a, an interesting way to kind of come at it at the beginning, I guess. So you were 29 at diagnosis. And 29, you, yes. And yeah. you're, you're a graphic designer. Yeah. Uh, um, how did life change at that point? Um, in the early days, it kind of, when I got my diagnosis, I think I felt quite relieved that actually it kind of put a name to a couple of things that I'd sort of been feeling, maybe not even motor symptoms at that point, just I was struggling to make decisions and clarity of thought and, and things like that. I was kind of getting a bit muddled sometimes and, and kind of not, you know, not being able to kind of give life my all, feeling a bit kind of depressed about stuff sometimes. And 
And actually, I think having a name for Parkinson's and realising that all these things could actually potentially be part of it and that medication might help it um, kind of made me feel like I actually had, you know, potentially something that was going to be able to be treatable and that would actually be, you know, I'd be able to live a fairly normal life. So in the early days, I wasn't too kind of scathed by it. But actually, as time progressed, I suddenly realised the severity of it. I think it kind of hit me a bit like a brick and... I realised that actually this was something I was going to get stuck with. And I think it's when you start medication sometimes that kind of reality hits. You, you're you used to taking, you know, ibuprofen or paracetamol or, you know, something that actually you take a tablet and it works and it does what it's supposed to do and it doesn't affect anything else. And then you start on Parkinson's medication and you realise this is your life now. And actually, I think that was the moment that I realised life was going to be very different. How did the symptoms progress for you? It was kind of more a tremor to start with. So my tremor kind of came on around the time I started medication, actually, which for me seemed a bit strange. Wow. But, um, yeah, that, yeah, that's it odd. Sort of, it felt like a bit of a sort of, like I, I kind of felt like I went downhill kind of quite quickly at that point. And uh, I've never really responded very well to the medication. It's never really done what it's supposed to do for me. It's always kind of made me feel worse or uh, not really been massively effective. And I think slowly over time it's got more kind of more frustrating my tremor's got more pronounced and now sort of moved into the other side so it started in my right hand side moved into my left and I now get quite a bad dystonia um and then I also have a problem with my neck at the moment which is apparently not related to Parkinson's but definitely not made any easier by the dystonia that I get in it so uh, that's a horrible challenge is thrown at me at the moment. yeah well, I know every time you get a new symptom you you wonder now is this Parkinson's or not like I just yeah. got diagnosed with neuropathy in my feet and I've got something going on with my shoulder and like I'm like Parkinson's yes no yeah. <laughs> it's crazy that's the problem as well you tend to tar everything with the Parkinson's brush so you tend not to bother going to the doctor so much or you kind of think oh it's just Parkinson's you know it'll go and then you suddenly realize maybe six months later it's still hanging around and it's probably something you should go to the doctors about. <laughs> yes. How long after diagnosis was it before you were able to laugh about Parkinson's? Um, I think probably to start with, I was quite jovial about it. And then I probably hit a slump maybe about three to four months in um, where I suddenly stopped going out and doing anything because I didn't know how to talk about it. And then around maybe kind of maybe sort of eight months to a year, I suddenly realised that actually if I told my story about it and if I talked to people about it, I could actually make it my own. I could kind of package it how I wanted to package it. And I could kind of almost... I realised that actually I was making my life worse by actually letting Parkinson's make me feel the way I was letting it feel. And I was actually letting it win and it was stopping me from going out and doing stuff, but actually I was letting it do that. You know, I could very easily turn around and say, no, Parkinson's, I'm not going to stay inside today. I'm going to go out and do something. I'm going to battle you a little bit and I think I gave in too easily at the beginning and I, I think when I kind of realized that I actually realized there was a lot of humor in the Parkinson's and actually that you know it's a bit of a ridiculous condition I and mean, it's horrible but it's also ridiculous I mean the <laughs> fact that one minute you can be absolutely fine and the next minute you can be just doubled over is just it's just it's kind of sort of laughable in a stupid way because you just you know you sometimes stand there and you're trying to put a shoe on and you just end up giggling at yourself and you just, I think <laughs> If you can see the funny side of things ever so often, it's not always that I can see it, but I think also it helps to explain to people sometimes in a kind of, humor's a great way of kind of explaining stuff to people that don't understand it. It's a very kind of open way of talking about it. You can be quite self, you know, deprecating and, and actually, you know, people kind of warm to that. And I think actually it lends itself really well to being described like that. Well, I think it takes sort of the scariness out of it for people too definitely does takes the scariness out of it for me I think as well <laughs> I know. what have you learned about yourself in the last six years um I've realized I'm a lot more resilient than I thought I was I think I always thought I was a bit weak um but I'm a lot stronger than I ever thought I was I know that sounds like a massive cliche or like a Kelly Clarkson song or something but it's like I think um I just I don't know I just think I you never really know until you're tested what you can handle. And I think I just, I always had myself pegged as someone who was weaker than they actually were. And I'm kind of proud of myself, I guess. And I think I've also realised that you can actually make your life what you want it to be. You do actually have that control over it. Even if it's something like Parkinson's, when it's trying to take control of everything, there's certain things you, you can take control of yourself. And actually, if you take control of those things, it makes you feel better. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, Emma, uh, what you're doing, especially online, uh, not only uh, demonstrating the strength that you have for yourself, uh, but it transcends into people around the world, and you're empowering a whole population of people with Parkinson's to just get out and do. 
Uh, and for that, I'm thankful for you. Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you to say. I mean, like, I guess I kind of hope for that as a, you know, it's, it's not really a byproduct. It is really what I'm kind of aiming to do. But I think I'm kind of trying to almost prove by making myself do it a little bit. I mean, last year was a very difficult year with my neck and everything kind of my neck dropped and, and I suddenly stopped kind of going out again. You know, that kind of moment when I got diagnosed with Parkinson's and I stopped going out, it kind of happened again. And I thought, oh, here we go again. I'm going to get stuck inside all the time. And so I set myself a little challenge of doing something new every day and blogging about it. So let's first talk about the name of your uh, daily task. It's the fuck it list, right? Yeah, you like to say that. <laughs> sure. Well, why, why not? Uh, so how did you come up with the fuck it list? Um, well, initially, it was the idea that I wanted to... I felt like I had a bit of a fun deficit from the last year, and I wanted to kind of almost do something that paid myself back for the fun that I thought I'd missed out on. And then I thought, well, actually, what what equates to fun? It'd be interesting to do a bit of an experiment around what I actually... What means, what happiness is to me in the end, and what actually brings me happiness. So there's like a massive spreadsheet behind the fuck it list, which is kind of me kind of documenting how things make me feel and you know if I do if I do an experience with a different person every day so I try and do it with someone different every day as well you know maybe someone I don't know or someone I've lost contact with um you know how our relationship changes as, as kind of humans you know whether we become closer friends or we you know more like family or you know actually whether we fall out when we're doing it um, and actually how that makes me feel kind of physically, emotionally, you know, and I'm kind of hoping at the end of it almost to have something which shows me as a person what makes me happy, but also that along the route might kind of inspire others to try and take control of their own happiness. Actually having something that makes me work on my own happiness and work on my own well-being is actually really important to me. So it, that was kind of the reason that I set the project up initially. It's just become a really sort of interesting project to kind of document you know my own happiness and to see the things that actually make me happy are kind of surprising me I guess it's things I never thought I'd enjoy really well, like what um I went to a firing range that was really fun um I did flower ranging which felt a bit kind of twee for me really but I actually loved it it was really really fun um I'm liking all the really sort of twee like home home making kind of stuff like sewing and things like that um there's some fantastic experiences in London where you can go and kind of do these kind of immersive eating experiences and things like that, which are there's so many of those which are incredible. And I just think I did a CSI um, experience the other day, which was amazing. You basically go along and they teach you how to be a scenes of crime of, of scenes of crime officer at a crime, <laughs> fingerprinting and stuff like that. That was brilliant. That's awesome. So what 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 a great year you're having. I'm having a fantastic year. And now you're uh, off to Kyoto, Japan, for the World Parkinson yes. Congress. <laughs> Which, have you ever been to Japan? No, I'm so excited. <laughs> what are you looking forward to the most in Japan? I, I, like everything. I literally, I can't, it's all kind of amassed into this massive excited thing in my head. I mean, I love the World Parkinson's Congress because it is just the most amazing place to kind of turn up and just realize that you're surrounded by people that just get it. I remember um, my first one and the last one was uh, was in Portland and I remember being in the queue to get a sandwich and turning to the person behind me and saying, I'm really sorry, I'm just kind of fumbling my coins, I've got Parkinson's. And they went, yeah, we all have. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah. So I kind of had a moment of realisation that actually I didn't have to explain away everything I was doing to, to everyone anymore, which was really, like, a really nice thing. I kind of, from that moment, almost just embraced it. But it's just it's an incredible experience to have that many people that just care about Parkinson's and are all trying to pull in the same direction around you it's an amazing thing and you're going to be on the panel living well with parkinson's disease what's your secret what what should people expect uh, from you and, and the other folks on the panel if they decide to attend um i think it's gonna be a really interesting panel because i think everyone has their own i don't know what the others are planning on kind of how, you know what their kind of secrets are and i'm kind of intrigued to almost know that on the day rather than know it before but um I'm really intrigued to see what they have to say because i think everyone has their own kind of tips and tricks to living well with parkinson's i would say on paper i'm not the the best candidate my mum laughed when i told her i was doing a talk on that panel because she said i mean you don't eat very well you don't sleep you don't exercise (laughs) you don't live well with parkinson's and i was like yes but i'm a big fan of technology mother and that's what gets me through it so uh, i'm going to be talking about technology i think mainly and, and the fact that technology is a real help um so that's kind of something i'm involved with professionally but also on a personal level i'm a kind of big advocate of tech being something that can help us to kind of live the lives we want to live, really. Well, I'm looking forward to meeting you in person at, uh, in Kyoto, Emma, and uh, I will be there in the audience uh, cheering you on. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to meeting you, too. Rebecca Miller, 
likes to be called Becca, is an assistant professor of the Department of Psychology at the Yale School of Medicine. She's on the WPC 2019 Comprehensive Care Subcommittee. She also has Parkinson's disease. She was diagnosed with PD about six years ago. She's speaking several times at WPC, focusing on tips and tricks for maintaining a work-life balance and maintaining balance and optimism when working and raising children with young onset PD. Rebecca, how did Parkinson's enter your life? So looking back, it actually made its entrance a while back, so probably around age 29. Um, I had symptoms of shoulder injury, and I started having a slight foot drag, and I lost my sense of smell. But I wasn't actually diagnosed till age 39. So um, I actually went to my acupuncturist and said, you know, I'm having these problems. And she said, go to a doctor, not me. So I did. <laughs> um, and, um, and so eventually, you know, went to my primary care doc, went to um, a neurologist, went to a movement disorder specialist, and then finally actually um, through a friend who works at Columbia, um, ended up meeting with Stan Fon, who was the person who diagnosed me. He said, you, it looks like you're getting upset. <laughs> I said, yes. <laughs> and he said, um, he said, take charge of your illness. Don't let it take charge of you. Go to the World Parkinson's Congress. It's in Montreal. Oh, wow. So I made arrangements and was able to go. And that was really such an amazing, empowering experience to see everybody there together. I, I'm interested as a, a clinical psychologist um, I know I sit down uh, across from a psychologist to, to, to work out how I'm feeling about Parkinson's. Do you, do you talk to yourself or do you, do you go for, for professional help with that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's weird when I start paying myself. I'm like, what's it, it, yeah. no. Well, actually, it's funny because I did attribute my first, you know, my symptoms to a psychological cause. I was like, I must be having conflicts about taking care of my daughter. That's why my arm is not moving. <laughs> um, and so, yeah. Looking back, it's sort of like, what? what what were you thinking? But it's amazing what you can kind of adjust to and ignore. That denial comes in handy. Yeah, I started uh, adapting with my left hand on things and didn't even realize it. I started typing with my left hand predominantly. Yeah, me too. Yeah, it was weird. Yeah, yeah, because I'm – so you, it started on your right side and you're right-handed? Yep. Like my front right pocket on all my pants just stopped being useful for anything because I couldn't get my hand in it. Yeah. When mm-hmm. you when you were diagnosed, how did you think PD would impact your career? Mm. I really worried that I would have to stop working and that I, I wouldn't be able to do my job. Ironically, it sort of actually, in some ways, at least for now, propelled me further in my career. So I didn't have an intention of going the latter faculty track. I was sort of mixed about that and I thought, you know, I'll do half time private practice and half time the mental health center and with the Department of Psychiatry. And once I was diagnosed, I decided that that latter track, faculty track, would really provide me with some more security. And so I pursued it. I, you know, got promoted to assistant professor and and then I'm I'm actually like working towards um being promoted to associate professor, which I never imagined would happen. So That's amazing. It's actually quite ironic. <laughs> yeah. So, and it's pushed me to do more writing because, you know, I feel like while I still have time, I want to be able to contribute as much mm-hmm. as possible. When writing was not really a big part of what I thought I would be doing. Um, so, so it's it's had interesting impacts. Uh, so you have your career, and you have your parenthood, and you have your PD, and you've got your writing. How do you balance it all? I don't think I do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Oh, you're supposed to have the I secret. Think, I think the idea, idea of a balance is a myth. So, um, but yeah, I mean, and it's sort of an ironic word to use in the context of Parkinson's too. But I mean, yeah, I guess, I guess, I you know. I, I say that with some, you know, humor and irony, but um, I guess I do my best to do the juggle. I mean, I feel like, you know, with PD, without PD, everyone's trying to juggle all these kinds of things. And um, and so it's really about, for me, like, staying flexible, 
accepting help, um, asking for help, that is a real challenge for me. Um, I'm slowly getting better at it, but um, I also, you know, I do have some help around the household, like um, with cleaning and laundry, things like that, which is really, really makes my life much, much easier. Um, and then just really trying to prioritize and look at what's most important to me. So, you know, I I know that I may not have so much energy during the day at certain times of the day and sort of saying, well, what what's more important? Going to, you know, going on my daughter's field trip or working today? And, right. and so really just thinking, you know what, I've, she's never going to be in kindergarten again. Like this is sort of my one chance. Um, so yeah, just trying to, to use it to put things in perspective and then really just kind of thinking about my values and what, what is most important to me and, and trying to focus on that. Not that I'm, you know, totally successful with that, but that's, that's one thing that I do. And I'm very lucky to have a very flexible job. So, um, it's sort of, you know, one of those jobs where you can never work enough, <laughs> basically, <laughs> but you can also sort of work anywhere, you know, with laptops and Wi-Fi nowadays. And it's just so much easier to kind of work when I can and where I can. Yeah, it's funny. It's a conversation that my wife and I have a lot about, you know, balancing my life. You know, I, I want to be an advocate for Parkinson's and do all the events, and, and I, I'm working full-time, and I'm doing this podcast, and I'm, you know, we have a nine-year-old, so there's a lot of stuff involved with that. And and this morning, she said something that really mm-hmm. resonated with me. She goes, it's not that you can't do those things, but now it's taking longer to recover from those things. So there's down yeah, there's downtime after all those things, and so it's you're not you're, you can't be as present because you're just exhausted. And I thought, oh, mm-hmm, very true. You, 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 yeah, so have you heard the spoon theory? No, it's not specific to Parkinson's, but this idea that you know when you have a chronic illness, when you have a disability, you have sort of a certain number of spoons a day. Um, based on how you're feeling, your energy level, et cetera. So sometimes you have just three spoons. Sometimes you might have a whole drawer full, but you're kind of deciding how to spend your spoon. Mm. Yeah. So I oftentimes use up my spoons too fast. (laughs) (laughs) I know I run out of spoons and then I have knives and forks and those are kind of painful sometimes, right? They are. (laughs) So how is it? No, I, I totally relate to that. Oh, good. Uh, so I'm, I'm not alone. <laughs> no, that's for sure. Um, I have a nine-year-old. You said you have a, a, a child in kindergarten? Yeah, so I'm a single mother by choice, so I had her with a donor, and uh, she is six. So, she's yeah, she's in kindergarten. She just started playing soccer. Um, she is uh, lots of fun and um, has lots of energy, and, and um, yeah, and that's... And that's a challenge. I, I, you know, I'm trying to introduce the idea in a kind of normal way that, you know, mom has Parkinson's, mom is tired, mom sometimes has trouble moving. Um, and she's been, you know, overall pretty, pretty good about it. You know, I, um, it, I think harder is my feeling guilty about not being able to yeah. always do all the things that I'd like to do with her because I'm just too tired. Yeah, my my son wants me to get down on the floor and play all the time, and I'm just like, there's some days I just can't do it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I yeah. just, it's just like, it's not today. And I feel horrible, but it's like, yeah. I, I just yeah. can't. I just, um, do, you know, and one of the challenges I have is engaging him in the conversation with Parkinson's in a positive way without scaring him. Uh-huh. Uh, because, you know, his, yeah. his mind goes to, you, you're sick, you're going to die. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, my daughter's, still a little young for that, although she does, she has talked about death, certainly. She said, you know, oh, mom, when I have, when I have my kids, you'll probably be dead already. I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> in a very blase way. Yeah. <laughs> but, but in general, you know, it hasn't really come up around the parking lot because I, I think she doesn't quite understand it yet. She's sort of starting to, but I, you know, and, um, and it's, yeah, it's a, it's a challenging conversation. It's trying to, you know, match it to where they are developmentally and use language that they understand and reassure them. And um, and then just, I think part of it is that you can't always be the one to talk to them about it. Yeah. 
that it needs to come from multiple sources. Um, and that's, you know, because I think sometimes it's scary to ask mom these questions or it's too emotionally intense for her to talk to me about it, you know? So that's one thing that I'm kind of banking on, uh, you know, working to ask friends and my parents to help with too. We, we've talked about maintaining balance and how hard that can be. How hard is it to maintain optimism? <sighs> that's a great question. And I'm not sure that I really maintain optimism necessarily, but um, again, I try my best. I mean, I think part of it is just trying to accept that, that this is the situation. There's a therapy called acceptance and commitment therapy that's basically really about like while everything is going on and while, you know, while you're anxious or while you're scared or et cetera, like how do you still move towards whatever you're interested in or focused on? So, um, you know, and it uses principles of mindfulness and meditation and um, and really trying to um, not get rid of negative thoughts or, um, you know, it sort of um, goes beyond the idea of staying positive, but instead it focuses on, you know, how do you keep moving forward while all these, you know, negative thoughts are happening that right. but to try and get rid of them actually like extra focuses on them and gives them more power. So, so I, I, you know, try and use those principles and, and use humor a lot and, yeah. and just kind of keep on going. I, you know, there isn't really an alternative. <laughs> no. Well, and you know, but you're, you're a great example of somebody who uh, takes their diagnosis, takes control of it, continues to grow their career and become a great parent and, uh, and, and, and an advocate in the Parkinson's community. And uh, you're, you're seeing a lot of success and, and it, it does, Parkinson's doesn't mean end of life physically or otherwise. No, for sure. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's really focusing on what I still can do and, and what I'm still interested in. And, and, um, and in some ways just using it to motivate me actually, because, you know, I know that, um, that I might have less time than other people. I mean, no one knows kind of what the future holds for any of us, but, but that I know that, you know, I, I probably won't have, you know, in my eighties or nineties, the same kind of life, um, at least not with the treatment options right now. Right. I am really hopeful that, you know, there'll be new treatments coming on the market, new, um, new interventions. Um, but at the same time, I, it, it has kind of made me live more in the moment and think about like, how can I maximize the time I have right now? That's great. That's great. Uh, and what are you looking forward to most in Kyoto? Just having a chance to see, you know, lots of people with Parkinson's, um, some who I've only met on Facebook and connected with on Facebook, and and to get to meet folks like you and um, others in person. And and then I'm just really excited to explore. We're planning on staying in one of those um, traditional inns, the Roykins. Oh. Yeah, so there are these like, traditional inns where they serve you tea when you arrive, and there are these... Um, you sleep on like traditional mats, and um, so that that should be a bit of an adventure. Well, good. Um, so, yeah. Well, Rebecca, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you speak and to meet you in person in Kyoto. Uh, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. It was great talking to you. Each episode of WPC 2019, I'm going to provide a Kyoto life hack, a tip, a cultural insight, etiquette advice, language lessons, an extra dosage travel guide. This is to help us all get better prepared for our trek in June. None of us want to offend anyone or be embarrassed. So James Heron, the executive director of the Japanese Canadian Cultural Center, has agreed to join us each episode to teach us a word or a phrase and provide some insight into the culture we can expect. James, let's start with the word or phrase of the week. Well, I thought thought maybe what we could start with, uh, even though I know over the last number of weeks we've been looking at... uh, Japanese phrases. At the end of the day, I mean, uh, you know, most most uh, most people going over are not native speaker Japanese. So it's probably once you've gone through your sort of um, 
your phrase book Japanese, you might actually have to admit that you don't speak Japanese if you get cornered. So <laughs> I thought perhaps being able to tell people that might be uh, might be helpful. It certainly was very helpful for me when I when I first went to Japan. Oh, good. Fire so, away. Make, well, so how to say I uh, you know I don't speak Japanese is uh, Nihongo ga dekimasen. Nihongo ga de- dekimasen. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm close. perfect. Uh, Nihongo means Japanese. Nihongo. So, um, Nihon is how the Japanese say Japan. And then Go is language. So Nihongo is Japanese. Fransago is French. Uh, Deutsche, as in German. Deutschego is German. So Nihongo is Japanese. Nihongo. Ga, ga is a short... Uh, Particle that sort of shows the object of a sentence, and dekimasen is the word meaning to be unable to. So nihongo ga dekimasen. Nihongo ga dekimasen. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. I'm gonna use um, that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> now uh, today, I thought maybe just to touch on another one of those um, sort of fundamental uh, cultural concepts, and I wanted to look at. Uh, the concept of face, which is something that is, um, of course, we understand that in, in Western cultures as well, that idea of, um, you know, the idea of to lose face or to save face. But in in Japan, it um, it's just, a, I think, a, a much more uh, powerful thing. Um, in Japan, people are much more sensitive to it. It's much easier to cause someone to lose face. Uh, so it's um, it's something worth looking at uh, some strategies on how the Japanese get around it and some things that we might uh, want to keep in mind as well. Okay. It's often said that Japan is a shame culture and uh, North America is a guilt culture. And <laughs> guilt, essentially, uh, if you think about it, it's we tend to use them interchangeably sometimes. But guilt is much more kind of an internalized thing. It's a kind of a moral or ethical code that is instilled by society or religion or something like that. But shame is more external. It's it's pressure from the outside group and how you are seen by the outside group. So how does that play out? Well, um, in many different ways. Um, it is, it's one of the example reasons, for example, that um, often, uh, you know, in, in the Japanese auto industry, there's sometimes a lot of resentment for... Um, for say North American uh, CEOs and 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 the um, and the, the you know the huge salaries or huge bonuses that they would receive, um, face is another interesting way that uh, that the Japanese will or Japanese companies will deal with unwanted employees. They will they will they have something called the window gazing tribe. If they want to remove someone from the organization, Japanese offices are often. Everyone sort of looks in and works together, and they'll put someone away from the group. They'll put them over by the window and not give them a lot to do. <laughs> and that sort of sense of not being able to contribute to the group will mean that uh, those uh, employees will eventually quit um, simply, again, out of that sense of shame and that loss of face. It's fairly passive-aggressive. It is kind of passive aggressive, and I, but I can think of lots of people I know uh, who, you know, if you put them in a corner, paid them a salary, and didn't make them do much, they probably <laughs> the, uh, the perfect job. Right. Um, <laughs> and is, is that, does that have a lot to do with to trying to uphold the, uh, the the pride of your family? Well, yeah, certainly um, that that sense of pride and honor. Uh, it's not just about yourself, but the idea of face also. You know, if you lose face, you often lose it. Uh, for the larger group, whether it is for your family or for your company. Um, so, yeah, so there is, uh, you have to be more careful with that. And another interesting way that this sort of comes to the fore is with uh, humor. Um, the Japanese have, I think, a very good sense of humor. But the one thing I always tell, you know, North Americans is really be careful, stay away from sarcasm. Um, you know, that sort of, uh, Seinfeldian zinger or put down that uh, that we certainly enjoy here, but um, you know often that'll really that'll go over like a lead balloon in Japan and uh, and will often make people quite uncomfortable and quite embarrassed. 
Oh no! Uh, it's, I, I've been known to to issue some sarcasm in my life. I, I, I'm now I'm afraid to speak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, in, in Japan, yeah, you you wanna you wanna dial that back just just a little bit. All right, thanks, James. I better be careful. If you want to learn more Japanese vocabulary or dive deeper into the cultural information about Japan, Episode 7 of WPC 2019 Podcast is a 45-minute conversation with James, which should give you a solid base before landing in Japan. From Curious Cast and the World Parkinson Coalition, this is WPC 2019. Special thanks to Emma Lawton and Rebecca Miller, who serve the Parkinson's community, and James Heron, all of whom joined us today in this episode of WPC 2019. Visit WPC2019.org to learn about the upcoming Fifth World Parkinson Congress, a global Parkinson's event that opens its doors to all members of the Parkinson's community, including those living with the disease, like me. Follow WPC on Twitter at WorldPDCongress. If you'd like to help spread the word about the podcast, be sure to rate us, review us, subscribe for free. You can search WPC 2019 and When Life Gives You Parkinson's. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and wherever you get your streaming audio. You can also listen at CuriousCast.ca and WPC2019.org. You can also connect with me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Just look up at Parkinson's Pod. Email Parkinson's Pod at CuriousCast.ca. WPC 2019 is written and produced by me, Larry Gifford. Dila Velazquez is our story producer and sound designed by Rob Johnston. I look forward to seeing you in Kyoto. Matashta. Canada may be known for its landscapes and friendly people, but beneath the surface lies a darker side of crime, history, and the paranormal. Since 2017, the award-winning Dark Poutine podcast has explored the shadowy corners of the Great White North and beyond, delivering chilling tales from a uniquely Canadian perspective. Hosted by Mike Brown and Matthew Stockton with over 300 episodes and fresh releases every Monday, Dark Poutine is your weekly ticket to the creepier side of Canada. Listen to Dark Poutine on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts.